church. Hey, Wings, I see you in the darkness over there. I see you. We're going to bring the lights up for you. You were in the darkness in worship too, weren't you? <laughs> I saw you. You, you. We're not going to leave you out this morning, I promise. We're going to bring you back up. Uh, my name is Quinn. I'm the student pastor at Bethany Church. And if you've been with us the last three weeks, it's been with me. And starting next week, a lot of you are going to be happy about this. Our pastor's going to be back. It's going to be awesome. Uh, hopefully today we finish chapter three and he'll start uh, next week with chapter four of Galatians. Uh, but I do want to take a moment. I was kind of in the back thinking about this. And I just want to kind of let you know, it was amazing when Barry said that they took 35 kids to camp, I, I begin to think, how many total did we take? We took 85 total kids and students and leaders, so right at 75 students and kids to camp this year. That's the most we've ever taken. Isn't that awesome? Isn't God good? And, and don't, I don't take that lightly because there's been years where we haven't taken that many, and God's still been good, but this year, I don't know what it was, just, just the, uh, kind of where we are maybe with our church, what we're doing at our church. It was like friends of friends were coming. It was incredible, and, and that's still happening. So I don't get this stage very much, so I'm going to brag on the students. Is that okay? I'm just going to brag on them. Not because of me, because of them. Uh, this summer, we take off Wednesday nights in the summer. I don't know if you knew that. Pa- adults, you take off Wednesday nights. Students, we take off Wednesday nights as well. And the coolest thing has happened this summer. Uh, right at the end of the school year, these kids are like so close and so tightly knit. They came up to me and they're like, hey, what if we continued a Bible study in the summer? And my first thought was, well, that's a great idea. G- good luck. You know, like, you know, the, that's a great idea, you know, because I just knew what else we were doing, right? That's why we take off Wednesday nights in the summer. And uh, so, but really my heart behind it was like, man, this is awesome. There's something that God's doing in you right? I saw that and I said, yeah, that'd be a great, great thing for you guys to do. And so the entire summer, our students have been meeting. And I'm not just talking about five students, like 20 and 30 students have been meeting on Wednesday nights in the summer and they've just been finding homes. Like it's been incredible. And I'm so proud of them. It's student led. Uh, I haven't showed up to one. Like, you know, hey, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. And, and they've really just went around the group and said, all right, who wants to do devotion next week? And, and it's cool. It, they've caught something. And I I, want to say even the kids, as they went to camp, some of the students, and you know this if you've been to camp, they came back different. Like I look at some in the room today, I won't point them out, they came back from camp different. You know, uh, some students are coming up to me like, I've been in my Bible, you know, 40 days. Like, and I'm looking at them like, I don't know if you even picked your Bible up before camp one day, you know, like, and they're in their Bible that much, and, and it's really contagious. So I challenge you, get a, get a, get a part, be a part of this, you know, like uh, get around some of these young kids, get around some of what they're doing, and I challenge you, let it rub off on you. Uh, it's rubbed off on me a little bit. Uh, hopefully over the years, uh, as they continue on this journey, uh, we'll be able to do it together. And as a church uh, with the new Kids Wing, it's going to be incredible to see as young families come as well. Uh, you should be in Galatians. Open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to kind of kick it off here, and you're going to see some similar themes of what we've previously talked about opening the book. Um, he, he doesn't really get off track too much in Galatians, and so we're going to see some, some key themes here that we've talked about before. We will read them, but then we're going to also cover them in detail uh, in, the, in our points. So if you're with me in verse 1, go ahead and stand, if you would, for the reading of God's Word. We should be in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. And here's what it says. You foolish Galatians. He starts off pretty bold. Who has bewitched you? Before your eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed and crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, you are now trying to finish. That's so important for today. You are now trying to finish by means of the flesh. Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you have heard? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and as we read the opening text today, would you begin to open our hearts so we might have a greater understanding of your word, but more than that, that you would pierce our heart and begin to deal with our heart and the things in our lives. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. As we open up the text, you're seeing the same things that are beginning to un- unfold this whole entire book. And it really is this. He's kind of doing this, the faith or works of the law. And he's kind of going back and forth there. We haven't seen the word faith yet in the text, if you're looking at the NIV version. But what he's saying is this. Are we going to start in faith but not finish in faith. Like, are you going to start in faith? What does he mean by that? Like, are you going to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ in faith, 
but you're not going to finish that way? And what begins to unpack here is is kind of this idea of starting in faith and finishing in flesh. He says it there in the text. It's starting in faith of a saving power of Jesus Christ in your life, like coming to know him, but then finishing the race with the flesh or finishing the thought process of what a Christian life really looks like with the flesh. And honestly, that is a completely opposite, and we talked about it last week, a completely opposite gospel than really what Christ came to do. And what he's beginning to outline here, and I think we can kind of start on this, is as we start down the Christian life, and I hope all of you are there today, and if you haven't been, go back and listen to some of these sermons as we begin to unpack what Galatians really is about. You'll see what Christ is really about. But as we look at this text, I want you to understand this. As you start the Christian life, wisdom will abound. What do I mean by that? The older we get, hopefully, as you read God's word, as you sit under, sit under the teaching of God's word, as you're convicted of God's, uh, the thing of, things of uh, this world that are in your heart, and God convicts you of those, and you begin to change those things, wisdom will abound. What happens, though, and I want to be very careful how I say this, but listen to the words of what he's also telling us. As wisdom abounds, sometimes we don't see faith clearly. What happens is the simplest things in God's word we have now made complex because now we are wise. And what God is trying to say to you is that's not, that's not what he wants. What he wants is when you get more wisdom, the simplest things become simpler. You now can explain them better to your family and to your friends. You can explain what happened to you and how it happened before you might say, oh, I don't know quite how that happened. I just know I felt that. I went up front or I felt that. My dad, mom helped me pray. Whatever it looked like. But now with wisdom that's abounding in your life, the knowledge that's coming from the Lord through the scriptures and through the teaching, you should make simple things simpler, not more complex. And I think that's what we're doing. We're making it so complex that we can't even understand it. We're like, man, I don't even know how I'm going to tell that person that, you know, or how I'm going to get. And he's saying that. Don't start in faith and finish in flesh. Don't make it something that it isn't. And that's what he's saying today. It's start in faith and finish in faith. And the cool thing about this verse, and I love this, is we begin to skip down to the other parts of this scripture today. This is going to be the foundation. Many of us in the room, young, old, you're going to see this. That you're going to remember the time you came to know the Lord. And I've, I said this in the previous sermons. That is a crucial part in your Christian journey. You're going to remind yourself of that all along the way. You're going to remember the way you felt. You know, I, I told you last sermon, remember the way it smelled. I don't know why I said that, but, you know, maybe it smelled like something. I don't know. But remember that moment because there's an important aspect to that moment. You placed your faith in something. You gave everything that you were at that moment in time and space and, you know, whatever fears you had in, into something. You put your faith in something. And what Paul has said, and we're going to read in other scriptures that he's written, what Paul has said is this. You're going to have to keep that faith. Keep the faith. Read a little bit further with me. In Galatians 3, 6, it says this. So also Abraham believed God. And I want you to, as we read on further, any faith, if we see the word faith, if you don't mind to underline your Bible, underline it or just take note of it. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have what? Faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by what? Faith. And announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All the nations will be blessed through you. All of them will be blessed. So those who rely on faith, there it is again, are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith, or a man of faith. It's a a beautiful picture if you begin to put it out there, and I I know you've highlighted or you've noted it, how many times he's using faith here. He doesn't want you to miss the main message, even with what we're beginning to look at as what was a promise to Abraham. We're going to read that in just a moment. But as the promise was given, given to Abraham through, and we'll see it here in a minute, the seed, it is this idea, we can't look around it, even to the Gentiles, that faith must abound. And as I look around the room, I I know, and I just know our church, there are some older people in the room. What I mean by that, you probably don't have any kids in your home. You probably have grandkids, and some of you might have great-grandkids or great-great-grandkids, maybe, if you're blessed, right? And what I begin to dare to say, and I, I hear my heart here, is I challenge all of you at that point in your life, I want you to finish in faith. I want you to finish the race in faith, not because of what your bodies can do anymore, I hope you hear my message here. 
Not because of, oh, I, I can't quite do what I once did. Because I think sometimes at that point in our life, and I'm not there, and I know that. God, here's my heart here. We judge ourselves on what we could and couldn't do. We judge our Christian life or what we used to do, but not what we can do. And here's what I want to tell those people in the room. It's, it's the faith that you have in Jesus that's going to matter. That's what's going to matter in this time of your life. If this time in your life, what's going to matter? You finishing in faith, not in flesh. You finishing in faith. What does that look like? Younger generations are going to look to you. I'm looking towards you. Others will look towards you. What, what do we need? <laughs> I hope you see this picture. It's so beautiful. You see, my generation, we're very, we can be fleshly. We can be, I can do it with my hands. I can do it with my feet. I can do it with my voice. You with me, church? But we're going to look to a generation who's doing it in what? Faith. We need to look towards you, and we don't need to see you do it with your hands. We don't need to see you do it with your feet. And in some ways, unless you just do it already, which is amazing, because you're incredible. You're not normal. You do it with your voice. You still teach. Amen. But what I'm saying to you is this. We need to see you do it in faith. Walk those years in faith. Be faithful to the Lord when it's not easy. And I know it's not easy. I see some loved ones that I know, and I see some of you. I've seen what you've walked through. I know what you're walking through. But I need to see you do it in faith. And many of you, almost all of you, the ones I can even bring to my memory, are doing it in faith. And I want to remind you to keep it up. Keep that journey up because it's helping the younger generation keep the main thing the main thing. It's not always what you do with your hands or your feet. It's what you do with the faith that you place in Jesus. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 7. It says this. This is Paul as well writing this. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And what does it mean? Listen, this is it. I have kept the faith. He doesn't go down all the accolades. He doesn't say, well, I preached to this church, this church, this church. I taught this group, this group, this group. Uh, you know, he doesn't even go down to anything else in that passage. He says, I have kept the faith. How do you finish the race? You keep the faith. That's the goal. If we've got a different goal, we've got we to gotta refocus on the right goal. The goal is to keep the faith. No matter what, if you do all these things and get sidetracked from things that aren't of God and get sidetracked of not really placing your full belief and faith in Christ, we've missed the message of Jesus Christ. We've missed it. And maybe some people go their whole life missing that message. Missing the message of, could it be that simple? If there is an overflow, and I don't want to be confusing here, but when you place your faith in Jesus, there are things that God's going to ask you to do. It doesn't mean, oh, Quinn's saying, if I believe in Jesus, I just sit in my pew. That's not what Quinn's saying. He's going to challenge you to do some things. He's going to challenge you in certain seasons to teach a class. He's going to challenge you in certain seasons. I just looked at him before he comes to a, a camp out. Is that right, Ron? <laughs> Me and Ron went to a camp out. I don't know if Ron really thought at this age he'd be going to a camp out for students, but he is. But God's going to challenge you to do those things. But let God challenge you. Not, don't just do it to do it. Let God do it. Because if God's not in it, it ain't going to be successful anyway. It ain't going to be blessed like we read in this verse. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, I want you to skip. You don't have to skip there if you don't want to. 1 Corinthians 9 says this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners, they, they run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Wow, what a cool picture. Everyone who competes in the game does, not, uh, does strict training. They, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but but they will do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone else aimlessly. What does that mean? You're not just going around thinking, oh, I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good, you know, and just like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. You follow the will of God in your life and he will be loud when he needs to be loud and he'll be quiet when he needs to be quiet. Some of you, you're too loud, be quiet. Some of you are not loud enough, be a little bit louder and God will be there with you. He'll show you the way just one step at a time. He says, I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Have you, can you see that picture? A boxer doesn't really, just, you know, he's either got a punching bag or he's got somebody he's punching, right? There's an aim to what he's doing. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. Woo, what a picture today. So that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. What is he saying? And I can show you this picture because I, I feel it. Before I get up here, I've been through the, the ringer. 
I've been against the ropes with God. You see what I'm saying? I've been, in the, I've been in the ring with God before I preached this message to you because Paul is saying, I don't want to be disqualified. I want to keep the faith. I want to run the race. I, I don't want to run aimlessly around just thinking, well, I, don't, I think I'm doing what's right. Faith in Jesus is what keeps you focused on what is ahead. That's what keeps you focused. And if you don't have your faith placed on Jesus every single day, every single decision, everything that you do, your family, your friends, your work, then you are gonna be off track. You're gonna be off track. If the main thing is not the main thing in every decision that you do, you're gonna be off track. And I think we gotta kind of figure that out in our minds because the goal is to stay steady with faith. Stay steady. You know the people that I'm talking about. They're not too flashy but they're faithful. You know what I'm talking about? Like, there's sometimes, they don't even feel like being here, but they're here. There's sometimes, man, they barely can, they're sick or something. They they might share the word of God with you, but it's not overly, you know, like, oh my gosh, that's the greatest thing. But it's like, they're sharing it. it. It's a faithful thing. It's a steadfast thing. It's sometimes you just look at someone's life and it's usually at the end of someone's life that you say, man, they were just faithful. Faithful in every season, no matter what came their way, no matter if this person was sick or this you know, child was going through this, they were just faithful through the course. And I think that's what God is saying to us today. Keep Jesus the main thing, but keep your faith in Jesus, not in man. Keep your faith in Jesus, not in what you can do, because there'll be one day you won't be able to do it. But where does your faith lie? It lies in Jesus. Do not run also in order to see what the works that you might do for the Lord instead for what the relationship that you might have with him. It's all about the relationship that you will have with him. And I just challenge you, look at your personality. What does your personality look like? Figure out those moments that are best with you and the Lord. If it's a quiet place, get in a quiet place. Some of you, you would go insane getting in a quiet place with God. So go do something else. Go fishing or women, uh, maybe cooking's your thing. Go in the kitchen and cook. Maybe that's your time with God, but do something to get away with God and find a place where you can really get sharpened by the word of God in your life and sharpened by godly people in your life. Look at Galatians 3.11. We're going to keep moving on. It says this. "Clearly, Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteousness will live by faith. There it is again. And the law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says... The person who does does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, this is also in the Old Testament, curse is the one who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham, which we're getting into now, might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. It's a beautiful picture when you really see it. Look at Deuteronomy 21, 23. It says this, you must not leave the body hanging on a pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day because no one who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not uh, disgrace the land the Lord your God has given you and that you've inherited. So there was this idea that you need to live in faith because Christ died so that you could live. And it's not to live this bondage life or to live this, you know, we talked about life in change. It's to live a life of freedom. And that's why I've left that bumper. Some of you are thinking that's a 4th of July bumper. But after what happened the next week, which I'm not going to go back on, but what happened to, what happened? I couldn't move the bumper. Because that's what we need to preach right now is true freedom in Christ. We, we experience maybe some of it in our life outside of these four walls, but we really need to experience it here first before we could ever experience it out there. And I would say this about any person or any candidate, but I was listening to a speech, and the very words of Trump, he said this. I want to be very careful here. He said, I am only here today, this is what he said, by the grace of God. And it just kind of struck me because that's kind of what we're talking about a little bit here. You and I are only here today. By the grace of God. And today, if we can realize that, it begins to open up our minds and our hearts to things that maybe we weren't quite opened up to yet. I believe that the Christian life is so much more. Please catch this. If you don't catch anything else, I think this will help everyone in the room. The Christian life is so much more than putting things on. You know, sometimes we think, man, if I want to bear my cross, it needs to be really heavy. 
Like it needs to be so heavy that people see how heavy it is. And here's the thing, and I don't think that's always biblical. I think more of the Christian life is you figuring out what to take off. What, what, what can I take off? Why do you take things off? To stay focused on Jesus. Some of us, you got too much load. You're bogging down in the, in the most important season in human history. You're bogging down. It's time to preach and teach and share and you to be at your best. And some of you know, and you, maybe you're honest, you're not at your best right now. And that's okay, but let's get you at your best. You need to start taking off. You need to start taking off. And I can't tell you what that is. Only God can. But you need to start taking off some of that things that are weighing you down. And the goal is to have faith in Jesus and keep that your central focus. Because as you take weights off, you begin to stand up straighter. You begin to breathe better. You begin to see the day differently. You guys know where I'm at. There's some days you wake up like, ah, well, I guess I'm going to do it. I guess I'm going to get through this day. You know where I'm at. You guys have been there. But God is wanting something more for you. For even our writer was in prison at one time and wrote with just amazing faith in Christ. How does some man do that? Not only we saw his conversion story, and I think that's a good place for you to remind yourself like I've told you but more than that he had a relationship with his heavenly father when things weren't quite the way that he planned it he was okay because his faith was in Jesus and the same thing is true with you if if that one thing at work doesn't quite work out you're gonna be okay why because your faith is in Jesus you know, that family thing, you know, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to figure it out. I'm gonna, it might be with a spouse. It might be with a son. It might be with a daughter. But if it doesn't work out, guess what? You're going to be okay because you have your faith in Jesus. You're going to be okay. And I promise you this, if you begin to look at it that way, things begin to look a little different. Those are the things that begin to overwhelm us. And that's even outside, I hope you see that, than the sins that we have in our life. These are just weights we've added on along the way. Well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That could be a godly thing, right? And you got to really focus in. What is God asking you to do? What is he asking you to do? Not what is he asking your neighbor to do. And in some cases, not what he's asking your husband to do or wife to do. Sometimes that lines up. Sometimes you're teaching a class, but your husband's out there doing security. But, but that's the season you're in. You see what I'm saying? Figure out what God's asking you to do. And maybe it's not nothing. Like nothing is a thing. Did you know that? Like, God might say in this season, you just need a rest. Because you don't see what's coming ahead around the next bend, around the next mountaintop. You need to be rested. What's going to happen if you don't listen to that? If you don't listen to when God's saying rest at points in your life, what is going to happen? You're going to do what you were always doing, and that, that bend is going to come, and you're not going to be ready for it. You won't be ready for it. Why, how do I know this? I've done it. <laughs> I've done it. Oh, I could do it. Oh, I could. Yeah. And I won't be ready for the next thing that God has for me. And I want to challenge you. There are blessings around the bend. And this is not a prosperity gospel, but God wants you to see something. You begin to see things the way God sees them when you begin to see his word correctly. And you keep the faith, the main thing. Look, at, look a little bit further in verse 15. Here it says this. We're doing okay on time. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. This is so good. Listen to this. I, I, I can almost just read this. This is a sermon in itself. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is the case. The, promise, the, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. That's so important. Underline that. His seed, not seeds. His seed. Scripture does not say, and to his seeds, like, well, there you go, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, oh, so good, who is Christ. So the promise came through the seed of Abraham, through the descendant, you can read it in Matthew chapter one, the descendants from Abraham to Jesus. And he's saying there's a promise coming, and the promise is going to come through that seed, not all the seeds, because we see the promise also given about the many, the blessings that he will have there. Look at verse 17. What I mean in this, the law introduces 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God, and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depend on the law, then it is no longer depends on the promise. There's, a, there's an idea here. We're going to unpack it. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through the promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of the transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred to had come. Here's what it's saying. He's saying we did have a law 
And that was set in place until his seed could come. I hope you're seeing it there. He said, we had to have this in place. It was, it was an important part of what we were doing. But there's something that's different now. He's saying it in this verse, and it's also teaching about the Old Testament in Genesis 22:18. 18. God promised Abraham that in your seed, all the nations of earth shall be blessed. All of them, to anyone. That's why Paul could even preach this message now to the Gentiles, because of his seed, the Abraham's seed, that the promise is now coming about. The cool thing about this, and we already talked about a little bit, is that it was a singular word here, like not plural, like we mentioned, that this wasn't a bunch of seeds. This was one true seed, and then we saw it. He he explained it there, that it was Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And through this seed, all nations could be blessed. How are they going to be blessed, church? Listen to what he said before. If they put their faith in Jesus. The blessing only comes through the acceptance of that new covenant. That's it. You don't get the blessing without the covenant. Do you see what I'm saying, church? You don't get to say, ooh, let me describe it. I've seen videos of people being interviewed online. And it might be a guy just on a street corner with a microphone. And he will ask them, hey, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Then he'll give them the mic back. Hey, what does it mean to be a Christian? And they could not tell you under the sun what that means. They couldn't give you a definition. They couldn't say, they're not even getting out the word Jesus, right? Like they have no idea, but they just know, you know, maybe I am. Or maybe I want to be. And here's what I want to say in this. The blessings come by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And here's what I want you to know. Some of you, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, but some of you have done that. Amen to that. Amen. You're a part of the new covenant. Amen. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. You'll get to spend eternity with God in heaven one day. Amen. But some of us have not. And what I mean by that, some of your friends, your family members, they don't know. And what I I dare to say is this, that guy on the street corner, I hope the preacher after the video's over says, hey, do you want to know? You know, you said you were, but can I tell you what it really means to be a Christian? Can I really tell you what it means to be a Christ follower? It's really not all these things you mentioned. It really isn't any of that. It's none of it, actually. Here's what it is. And I I dare to say that God's going to use you and I to bring clarity, truth. That's what the world is looking for, truth. Not our own thoughts, not our own, well, I'm going to get them right before they get saved for Jesus. Have have you seen this concept? And I'm off on one, but we're going to get back. We want people dirty when they walk in here. We want people sinful when they walk in here. They're not going to look good. They're not going to be unsinful when they walk in this place. I'll never forget a story at my home church. There was a guy, he walked in, he had long hair, tatted up. He, he was actually uh, in a wheelchair, but if he wasn't, you would think he was in a biker gang. <laughs> and I remember as a young kid, a 12-year-old kid, thinking, man, why is he here? I mean, I thought this as a young boy. I thought, well, they're going to kick him out of here. You know, like, he can't be here like, looking like that, you know. Uh, and I saw the most beautiful picture happen. Very traditional church. They let him stay. He listened to the word of God, and he left. Nothing really happened. Guess what? He came back again and again. And over time, there was a, I think it was an evangelist that came, and he went up to the front and he got saved. And I want to say, oh, the next week he cut his hair and covered his tat, you know, whatever, however you feel about that. We're not, that's not even a message about that. But here's my point. It took time. Over time, there's some things that he changed. And it wasn't because the pastor was right there going, hey, let me tell you, sit down, son. You know, it was because God began to speak to his heart into his life. And he began to change some things in his life. And guess what? You wouldn't know this man today. You wouldn't know him. You wouldn't know. He'd walk in here, you wouldn't even know that's the same man I just described. He's read the Bible, I think, up to upwards of 15 times all the way through now. And it just begins to, to show you that there's times in your life that your, your thoughts are not quite right. And you got to get the truth of God in there. And it really is this. You don't change people. God changes people. The pastor, in a sense, we share the word of God, but the Spirit's the one that really changes you. It moves through you and convicts you. Why is that? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what part of this message is going to speak to you. And as we finish this message today, here's what I challenge you. If the Spirit is speaking to you, don't leave it there. That's not a good place to leave it. Oh, I'll do it in the car. You won't do it in the car. Oh, I'll do it when I get home. No, you won't do it when you get home. You'll be on to other things in your life. This is important. God is saying it's important. So if he's saying something to you, deal with it. Let's look at this last part of scripture. Skip down with me in the verse, into verse 23. We're going to read this. 
Keep note of when it's saying faith again. If you want to highlight it, highlight it. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under, that, uh, under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. We've talked about this concept. Children of God through what? Faith. For all of you who were baptized unto Christ have, clo- have been clothed yourselves with Christ. Look at this. This verse is so important. Listen to it. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, and there's neither male nor female, for you are all in one in Christ. If you belong, this is important, you're one in Christ. If, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, the promise was given to Abraham that your seed, his seed, it would produce this. But the promise was revealed in Jesus Christ. It came to fruition when Christ came on the scene, when he did what he said he was going to do, and when he died on the cross and rose from the grave. If you would, stand to your feet as the band's going to come. I'm going to pray over you as we finish this message today. I just challenge you again, listen to what the Spirit's saying. Don't listen to what I'm saying or what maybe you're, you're, you're conscious right now. Like, oh, don't do that. Don't do this. Just let that go. And maybe, maybe right now you're just going to say, God, I'm going to do what you asked me to do in this next moment. The band's going to play. I want everyone to bow their head and close their eyes. And as they play, I want you to just ask this simple question, Lord. Have you picked up some things along the way that God's saying it's time to now offload? They might even be some really, really good things. But what I need you to hear from the Lord today, I can't say it, but the Lord can say it to you. It's time to take that off. It's time to do this instead. And God's going to give you some clarity. Maybe he doesn't, you don't quite know what that is. But he's saying, you need to take this off. I know what's around the next bend for you. I know what your family's going to go through next. Please listen to me. Maybe some of you, maybe there's someone in the room, you, you're coming out of that season. There's a season where you have been resting and you've been preparing. And God is saying, it's time. Let's go. You're excited. I'm excited. Let's go. And he's going to give you the next thing. Maybe it's going to be volunteering for the WANA program. Maybe it's going to be, you know what, I, I've never ushered or I welcome people, but I'm going to try that. I don't know what it is, but God does, and he's going to give it to you. And Lord, I don't know, but maybe there's someone here still, in light of all of these messages that we preached about the grace of God and about the faith that we have to have in Jesus, maybe there's still someone in this room. They do not know you. And today, as they're going to sing... Lord, I'm going to pray. They're going to say, you know what? What am I waiting on? I want to know that I know that I know. I want to know Jesus. I want to start that relationship. It's been a foreign concept, but I want to make it like my spiritual eyes are open again. And I want to be like Paul. I want to live in faith, and I want to finish this in faith. Lord, we give you the honor and the glory for whatever happens here. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.